Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Just Homesteading and welcome to my first video in my wine making series. Um, during the video where I did a tour of my root cellar, um, I showed you my wine rack. I asked that um, anyone watching let me know if they would like to see wine making videos. So there were a good number of people in the comments that said that they would be interested in, in um, seeing videos about wine making. So here we are. We're going to start with the basics. Um, and, you know, be mindful that this is how I make wine. There are people that make wine with a lot less um, items than I do, but this is the way that works best for me. This is how I make a good wine. I make a lot of wine. So where I live, um, by law, I can make 200 gallons of wine per year in my house. I don't make that much wine. I probably make about half of that. And then I don't, I would say maybe 90% of my wine I give away to friends and family. Um, I just enjoy the process of making wine. So, and I, I probably only drink wine maybe a couple of times a month. So I really, I make wine because I enjoy it and I make large batches of wine because of how long it takes for the wine to get to a state where you can actually drink it. So I don't have filtering equipment, so I don't filter any of my wine. Um, all of my wine bulk ages to the point that it can be bottled. And for most of my wine, that takes a minimum of six months. So if I'm going to be spending six months making something, I'm not going to make a small batch because for me that doesn't makes sense. So for each gallon of wine, you get about five bottles. Um, and like I said, most of the wine that I make, I give away. I like to be able to share my wine. I like to get feedback on my wine so that way I can do better going forward. Um, so I normally make six gallon batches, somewhere between, I was no, between five and six gallon batches which, so five gallons gives you about 25 bottles, six gallons gives you about 30 bottles. And that's a lot of wine. So currently um, in my basement, I have probably 70 gallons, maybe a little over 70 gallons of wine. And they're all at the point where they need to be um, sweetened and bottled and I, I just haven't had the chance to do that but i will be doing that in the very near future because i need to free up some of these carboys for the next batches of wine um so after you know we talk about you know what things do you actually need to make your wine um the next video will be uh, me starting to actually make a batch of wine so first, and I think most important, and excuse the bottle, this is well used. Um, this is Star San. This is a type of sanitizer. You don't have to use this brand. You can use whatever brand you want. Just make sure that it is safe for winemaking and safe for consumption. Um, I like Star San because I don't have to rinse the vessel after I use this. Um, there's a ton of bubbles for this. They say, don't fear the bubbles. That's the phrase because when you use star sand, you will likely still have bubbles in your vessel, whether that's a carboy, um, your fermentation vessel. And, um, you know, it doesn't affect the flavor of the wine, at least not for the wine that I make. I follow the instructions in the bottle. Um, I think you use, it might be two ounces of star sand to five gallons of water. Um, so I don't, I follow the instructions and it doesn't impact the flavor of my wine. So if you get nothing else from this video, know that you need to wash and sanitize anything that may touch your wine. That is the most important aspect of winemaking um, because you don't want to get any contaminants, any bacteria in your wine because it will ruin the entire batch. So, you know, everything that touches my wine gets washed with soap and water. Um, I don't use the same dish rag that 
I use to wash my dishes. Um, everything that I use for my wine is separate. Um, and that's just, you know, I want to be, I want my wine to be safe. I don't want it to be contaminated because like I said, it takes a long time to get to the point that you can drink your wine and you don't want to ruin it. So wash with soap and water first and then use star sand. Sanitize, sanitize, sanitize. And if you don't remember if you sanitize something, do it again. You also want to make sure that you are sanitizing um, in between wines. So just like if you were you know, pruning your fruit trees, you would clean your um, shears with alcohol before you went on to prune the next tree. So if you are working on say a Concord wine, you know, you use your tools in the Concord wine, then you sanitize them again, and then you use them in your Niagara wine. Okay, so make sure you always, always sanitizing. That is the most important aspect of winemaking. I have all of my tubs here, and I'm just going to pull things out of the tubs and just talk to you about what I have. A huge, like literally, <laughs> this spoon is huge. So you need a, a spoon long enough to um, be able to stir your wine when it is fermenting. So fermenting is the process of turning sugar into alcohol. Um, at the perfect temperature, most wines only need to ferment for seven to 10 days. Um, but again, that depends on, you know, is it a little cool in your house? Um, you know, is it a little hot in your house? You know, is your yeast strong? Things like that. So you need a spoon um, because yeast needs, needs oxygen. So you want to make sure that you are stirring um, your wine while it's fermenting. And again, you'll see more of that once we're actually making a batch of wine. Again, back to cleaning and sanitizing. So I have all different sizes of brushes. So this one I use for bottles. This one, you see how long it is. This is what I use to clean my carboys. Um, they have plastic and glass carboys. I don't have any plastic carboys in my house. All of mine are glass. You need to be very careful with them because if you break them, they can be extremely dangerous. Again, all different sizes of brushes. And I, I'm not gonna show all of them to you, but I have tons of different sizes depending on what size the carboy is, what size maybe the wine bottle is. Um, just so that way I have everything that I need to ensure that anything that is touching my wine is clean. You need, so this is, this is actually a new siphon hose that I haven't used yet. And I, I have two sizes of these. So this is the large one. So this is the siphon hose um, or the, the siphon that I would use to rack. So rack means taking your wine from one vessel and putting it into another. Um, so this, I would use this, so you, you actually just, you will, you would pump it. And um, when you're racking, the vessel that you're racking from needs to be higher than the vessel that you're putting the wine into, um, because this uses gravity. They do have um, other types of equipment that you can plug it in, but I don't, I don't have any of that stuff in my house. So I just use these, they're fairly inexpensive. So you get this part and then it also comes with with tubing. So the tubing you would attach to this end, and a lot of this will make more sense once we're actually making wine, but you would, and sometimes you need to put this in a little bit of hot water to get the, the plastic piece into the tubing. Um, and then that's how the wine goes from one vessel to another. And again, 
these all this needs to be sanitized before it touches your wine so what i would do is i would actually pump this as if i would be um, racking my wine and i run the sanitizing solution through um, this and then through the tubing so that way everything that touches your wine is clear and then you also want the outside of the tubing and the outside of this to go into the sanitizing solution so that way everything is sanitized everything is clean okay so some of the other supplies that you need you need airlocks so this let me get this out. this is an airlock this keeps um air out of your wine so you would fill this partially with water um and it, like I said, it will just keep air out of your wine. This is a bung. So the bung, you will set this into your carboy and then the airlock goes into it. And then that's how you keep air from getting into your wine. Um, if you get too much air in your wine, it causes oxidation, which will impact the flavor of your wine. It impacts the aromas. Um, so you want to do your best to keep air out of your wine. This is a pH tester. This is not a necessity, but I do have this. Um, I don't use it very often. I think I've used it maybe once or twice. So I make a Catawba wine, Catawba um is known to come in with very high acid and sometimes if the acid in your juice is too high um it won't ferment so they have or additives that you can put into your juice that will lower the acid levels enough that the yeast can actually start fermenting and this is just a different style of an airlock. So I've actually transitioned to these for the most part. I'm still using some of the other ones, but I prefer these types of airlocks over this one. So when you're fermenting, it does attract those little like fruit flies. And I've found that fruit flies can get into these airlocks um, more often. And then, you know, you have to take your airlock off and you clean it. So the water in here should not be going into your wine. If it is, there might be something wrong with your airlock. But I like to keep the fruit flies out of my airlocks because, you know, then I have to go in and clean them. And again, these, they get sanitized. Um, and I actually fill my airlocks with um, sanitizing solution. Some people use alcohol, um, but just water is also fine. But please, sanitize. Anything that touches your wine needs to be sanitized. We have a hydrometer. And so um, one of the things that I would suggest buying, you know, if you really want to get into winemaking is a hydrometer kit. So they come with this, this, this is the actual hydrometer. It's glass. This tells you, um, the bricks levels and what your potential alcohol content could be. So um, bricks is essentially the sugar content in your um, liquid. So it could be juice, it could be water. So like if I would fill this with water right now, um, this would not float at all because there's no sugar and water at least it shouldn't float if it's floating in water that you probably need a new one these are made out of glass um some people just drop this into the fermentation vessel so i do all of my fermenting in these i think this one is a six gallon bucket um, and some people will take their hydrometer and just drop it in there and check check their bricks levels that way I don't do that because these are glass and um, you know I would hate for this to break in a batch of wine right because now it's ruined because you can't drink something that has glass in it or at least you shouldn't right um, so what I do is you know I will get a ladle again it's sanitized 
and I will put some of the, um, and this is sanitized too. When I say sanitize everything, I really mean sanitize everything. And I'm gonna say it over and over again because it is the most important aspect of winemaking. Um, and if you see me looking this way, I'm actually facing a window so I can get distracted easily. So if I see a car driving past, my head just naturally will look that way. Or if I see something out the window, I'll just look that way. Um, so I would sanitize this. I would add the juice to it, or if it's been fermenting for a while, I will add the wine to it. So you put the, the liquid in here and then you put the hydrometer inside. And depending on the bricks level, this will float. And it'll also tell you like when your wine is done fermenting. So when you first start making your wine, depending on you know where you put your your bricks level at, um, you know that's a, a personal preference. Um, but you do have to be mindful of your bricks level when thinking about what type of yeast you're going to use. And we'll talk about yeast next. But you know there's a, a bunch of numbers on here, and it's really small. But if you put your wine at, or your juice, because it's not wine yet, if say you want to, you put your um, juice to a 35 bricks level. So if you want to raise, and this is bricks, B-R-I-X, not like the bricks you use to build your house. If you want to say to have a really high alcohol content, right? So the highest number on here is 35. So a 35 bricks level will give you um, about a 20% alcohol content. And you would need a special yeast for that. Um, so then when you look at the hydrometer, um, you know, there are also the specific gravity numbers are on here. So you want your specific gravity to get down to either 1.000 or below. And then that's how you know that your wine is done fermenting. Um, Cause one of the larger numbers on here is 1.100, which would give you a, about a um, maybe 13-ish percent alcohol level. Um, so bricks is important. That's something that you can just Google and read about. Um, they are, there are websites that will tell you. So like if you're starting out at maybe a 16 bricks, there are websites with calculators that can tell you how much sugar to add to your liquid to get you up to say 20 bricks. So that way you get the alcohol content that you want. Um, and that's what I do. It's the easiest way to do it because it'll tell me that I need to add six cups of sugar. Um, so as far as increasing your bricks levels, you can just use plain um, white sugar, you can use raw sugar, you can use honey. Um, so you can you can use what you want. I normally use um, a type of sugar. And depending on the wine, I've used brown sugar, I've used white sugar. So that's, that's what I use. So yeah, if you don't have a lot of funds, you know, in order to get into winemaking, this is something that I would spend money on. After, of course, you buy your sanitizer, right? Uh, because it, it's really helpful. You want to know how, you want to know what your bricks levels are. You want to know what your potential alcohol content is. And you want to know when your wine is done fermenting. Because sometimes your wine can look like it's finished fermenting because it's not bubbling um, the way it was before. But when you actually test your bricks levels, you will find that your wine is not done fermenting. Um, your wine needs to be completely done fermenting before you um, bottle it, because if not, you will get bottle bombs. So calcium carbonate, um, I've only had to use this once. This is what you use to lower your acidity levels. Um, in your 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 juice before you start making wine. So this is potassium sorbate. Let 
this is a wine stabilizer. So if you decide to sweeten your wine after it's done fermenting, um, you can absolutely do that. Some people don't, it's up to you. You need to add this to your wine. This stabilizes your wine and prevents it from restarting fermentation once you add a sweetener to it. If you do not add this to your wine before you sweeten it, you will absolutely get bottle rockets. And as someone like me who gives a lot of wine away, you know, I don't want to give wine to anyone that could potentially explode. I mean, I don't want it exploding in my own basement um, because I don't want to have to clean up the glass and the wine. Um, so you would add this and then you would also add Camden tablets. You would add these at the same time. This stuff is really strong. Um, you could actually also use Camden tablets to um, sanitize your wine making equipment. Um, I use Star Sand, but um, these little tablets prevent, and they actually, they make a powder of this so you don't actually have to crush up the tablets. I've been using the tablets, so I continue to use the tablets. I'm gonna, I'm gonna close this up. <laughs> Um, so the Camden tablets prevent uh, wild yeast from fermenting in your juice. It prevents bacteria. Um, it's just one of those things that helps keep your wine safe. So this is something that I would add to juice that I pick up before um, I actually add my own yeast. Yeast Energizer, again, this um, this is something that I would add to my juice 24 hours before pitching my yeast. And pitching your yeast just essentially means putting your yeast in the juice that you want to turn into alcohol. And then also, yeast nutrient. So when I get juice from one of the local wineries, um, day one, I add in yeast nutrient, yeast energizer, and Camden tablets. I put this stuff in, um, you know, and this is after I check my bricks levels, adjust the bricks level as needed. Um, so, you know, when I get juice that I want to turn into wine, you know, I go, I pick it up. The first thing that I do when I get it home is I sanitize all of my equipment and then I use my hydrometer to test the bricks level. So some places um, sell you the juice at what they believe is an appropriate bricks level. Um, even if, you know, they say that it's at 21 bricks, when you get that juice home, you just want to check and make sure. And if that's the bricks level that you want, then you can move on to the next step. Um, if the bricks level is not where you want it to be, then you need to adjust the bricks level before you do anything else. Um, you could do that by adding sugar or you could do it simple syrup. It's up to you. I usually just add the sugar because I don't want to water down my wine. After you adjust your bricks level, you would come in with your yeast energizer, your yeast nutrient, and your Camden tablets to kill off any wild yeast. You let those three things stay in your wine for 24 hours, and then after 24 hours, you can pitch your yeast. So there are all different kinds of yeast. There are websites that talk about what types of yeast would be best for um, different types of wine. And I have a few in here, and honestly, these are pretty old. They're probably not any good anymore. Um, and I don't actually use this type of yeast anymore, but these are the types that I used for my very first batch of wine. 
Um, I've learned a lot more about yeast. One of my favorites is 71B. That allows a lot of the, the fruity flavors and the types of wines that I make to remain. Um, if you need, um, so like if you wanna have a higher alcohol content because um, all, most yeast will max out at a certain alcohol level. Um, like I said, you want to get your your specific gravity down below 1.000 um, before you take your wine from the fermenting vessel to wherever you're gonna put it to bulk age. And I forgot one of the other important things that I add 24 hours before pitching yeast. So pectic enzyme. This helps you clear your wine, um, especially if you're making a fruit wine and especially if you're making a fruit wine from fresh fruit. This really just pulls um, a lot of, I call it sediment, out of your wine so that way when your wine is finished it has a nice clear color to it. Um, you don't want your wine to be, um, I guess, foggy. You want your wine to be, to be nice and clear. And again, so this is, you know, this is kind of like letting you know what supplies that I use. So if you want to make wine along with me, you can get these supplies. These, you can get these from your, um, like we have wine making stores where I live. So I could go there, I could get bottles, I can get yeast nutrient, I could get um, pectic enzyme, I can get juices, um, but you can also find all of this stuff on Amazon and the majority of it is fairly inexpensive. And when I'm adding these things to my wine, I follow the directions on the package. So for yeast nutrient, you add one teaspoon per gallon of juice. So if I was making a five gallon batch of wine, I would add five teaspoons of yeast nutrient um, and so on and so forth. I would add a half teaspoon per gallon of yeast energizer. Um, Camden tablets are I believe one tablet per gallon of wine. I also have a bunch of these. Um, this is, I use this as a color coding system. Um, I do put labels on some of my wines, especially if I'm giving it away, but for the most part, I don't. Um, so I use these because these come off of the bottle very easily, which allows me to reuse the bottle um, as a color coding system. So like if I have a clear bottle with a gold cap if I look in my notes, I know that that is a Catawba wine. Um, so that's a color coding system that I use. You can use whatever works best for you. If you wanna put a label on every single bottle, then um, you can do that too. Um, one of the things that I didn't bring up here, I do have bottle racks. So the bottle racks I use after the bottles have been washed with hot soapy water and then sanitized. So this thing that I have here actually sits on top of one of my bottle racks and and I'll just use this as an example I can take the bottle put it over and when there's liquid in here it will actually when you push down it will shoot the sanitizing solution up into the bottle um, to sanitize it and then you would put the bottle on a bottle rack and let the sanitizing solution drain out until you're actually ready to fill the bottle. You know, wine making is, is actually I think it's easy once you learn the basics. So, you know, sanitizing, um, putting in the right additives. And again, there are people that don't put yeast nutrient. There are people that don't use um, yeast. Some people prefer the taste of the wild yeast that's on the grapes. Um, you know, and if you want to make wine that way, that's that's perfectly fine. But this is this is how I do it. I find to be the easiest way to to make wine. Um, and like I said, some of this will make more sense because um, you know when you I've been making wine for probably about maybe five years now. So, you know, as when you do something a lot, you kind of forget about those little important steps. But, you know, if I've forgotten anything, 
you know, I'll tell you about it when I'm actually making the wine. So if you watched the Root Cellar Tour video, you saw that I had two kit wines down there that I have not used. So um, we're going to use those and make wine out of the kits. I've never made kit wine before, um, but I've seen good reviews. So we're gonna do that. And then we're also going to make some wine from store-bought juice. The very first wine that I made was from store-bought juice to make wine from juice from the store because that's readily available for a lot of people. And it's an inexpensive way to perfect your winemaking ability. And then um, when you're ready, you can move on to making wine from fresh juice, fresh juice or even from grapes. Um, I've only made one batch of wine from fresh grapes. Um, the, the juice is, so for a five gallon bucket of Concord juice, I usually pay around $25. So it's not terribly expensive, but it's a lot more juice and I have to drive, what, maybe two hours to get it. So it's it's not something that I, I want to mess up. And you know, people who are watching live, um, you know, all over the United States. Um, and then I think there are some people who don't actually live in the United States. So what's available to you might be different. The costs may be higher. Um, so it's good to start with store-bought juice and you can use any kind of store-bought juice that is 100% juice. Um, if it's 100% juice, it should ferment. And a lot of people say that when you're using store-bought juice, you don't need to add in the Camden tablets and stuff like that. I still do it because that's my process. And I would rather do it and not need it than to have not put the Camden tablets in and then now I have some type of bacteria in my wine. Um, so, you know, you'll be able to go out and, you know, get some store-bought juice and, um, you know, go through this process with me. Yeast you can find on, I'm actually gonna need to order some. Yeast you can find on Amazon. And I might actually just use these that I have. Let me see when they expired. So these expired December of 2021, but I might try one just to see if this would actually ferment. So some people um, keep their wine, or not their wine, their yeast in the, in the fridge. Um, I bought this off of Amazon and I don't believe it was refrigerated before it came to me. So I have not refrigerated these, but the wine, but the yeast that I bought from my local wine making supply store, they did have theirs in the refrigerator. So when I bought it and um, brought it home, I did in fact keep those in the refrigerator. But like I said, these weren't in the refrigerator and they worked just fine. You know, and speaking of yeast, I think I forgot to mention that after you add in your pectic enzyme, your Camden tablets, your yeast nutrient, and your yeast energizer. You know, once you wait those 24 hours, then you can pitch your yeast. So just, again, that just means putting your yeast into your liquid. Um, there's also different ways to do that. So some people will put their yeast in some warm water to allow it to start working before they put it into the wine. So they put it in a separate bowl or a cup or whatever, and that's what they do first. I literally, I open the packet, I sprinkle it across the top and I've never had any issues except in the wine where I knew that the acid was too high. Um, so yeah, you sprinkle the wine, you sprinkle the yeast on top and then, um, and I don't mix it. I just, I just sprinkle it on top and then I put a very thin cloth over the top and I put the cloth over the top because again, the fermenting smell does attract fruit flies and I don't want fruit flies um, in my wine. Once the wine, once the yeast gets going, again, you would be stirring your wine daily 
Um, again, you will need to sanitize your spoon every day. Some people keep sanitizing solution in a spray bottle and they just spray their equipment before they use it. Um, you can do what works best for you. Just please make sure that you sanitize it. It's done fermenting and you'll know it's done fermenting because you'll have a hydrometer and your um, specific gravity level will be below 1.000. Um, you can then rack your wine to your um, bulk aging vessel. And I will show you what I use. You want to make sure that you have a bunch of different sizes of bulk aging vessels um, because every time you rack your wine, you lose a little bit of it because you want to make sure you leave that sediment at the bottom. Um, that sediment at the bottom will keep your wine from being clear once it's actually time to bottle it. Wine is done fermenting and again you know it's done fermenting because your specific gravity level is below 1.000. You can then rack it into a carboy. That's what I use most so we'll just talk about carboys. And you use the, the siphon that we talked about earlier to rack the now wine from the fermenting vessel into the carboy. You would put it into the carboy with um, Camden tablets. Anytime I rack my wine, I add more Camden tablets. So you put your wine into the carboy, you add your your bung and your airlock on top, and then you you just let it sit. Um, and then as the sediment falls out, you will, um, you know, continue to rack it. Um, for wines made out of grapes, so I make, um, and Concord and Niagara are big ones. Those do need to be cold stabilized. Putting it in, um, just a, a, a cold temperature. So what I would do is I would just sit my wine out on a deck. But you, if you're using glass carboys, you do want to be mindful of your temperatures because you don't want the wine to freeze. And whether or not your wine freezes depends on the temperature. Um, it depends on the temperature and it depends on your alcohol content. Um, but if you're getting down to maybe like 20 degrees, please bring your wine inside, especially if it's in a glass carboy because your wine will freeze and your carboy will break and you will lose your wine. Um, but cold stabilizing your wine actually allows some of the acid to drop out of your wine. And when that acid drops out of your wine and you'll get little wine crystals at the bottom of your carboy, um, you will get a smoother wine. So that's not something that I did the first time I made wine and I didn't do it because I didn't know about it. So when I would put my wine in the refrigerator um, to drink it, if I left it in there for a day or two, the wine crystals would actually drop out in the bottle. I mean, just because I want my wine to be clear, I want it to be appealing to the eye. Um, you know, I don't want those wine crystals dropping out in the bottle. I want them to do it before I bottle it. Um, wine making the way that I do it requires a lot of patience. Um, because you really have to give your wine time to drop out all of that sediment. Um, because if you don't, it will drop in your bottle. And I know that because I learned the hard way. So, um, you know, you get really excited. You know, you want the wine to be finished. You want it to be, um, you know, ready to bottle, ready to drink, ready to share with your friends. But you, you do have to be patient. Um, and don't be afraid to taste your wine as you are going through this process. So when you bring your juice home, taste it, see what it tastes like. You know, when you are checking your bricks levels to see if your wine is done fermenting, you already have the supply sanitized. Put a little bit in a glass and taste it. Now I will tell you, um, wine, um, while it's fermenting is not the most um, appealing to the taste buds, but it's helpful for you as a winemaker to see 
um, how the flavors in your wine are changing, right? Because when the wine is in the middle of fermentation, you know, there's going to be bubbles in there, right? It's going to taste carbonated. Um, but when your wine is finished, there shouldn't be any carbonation in your wine. If you still have carbonation, then you can either degas your wine. That's not something that I do. Um, or you can let it age longer. And that's, that's what I do. I will age my wine until there are, until there's no carbonation left. Because again, you know, leaving carbonation in your wine, it does risk, um, bottle bombs because if there's still carbonation in your wine there's a chance that your wine is not done fermenting and if your wine ends up fermenting in the bottle it will eventually push the cork out so that's i mean that's a lot of information i am going to show you the um the bulk aging wine that i have in my space right now just to show you what it looks like um, and to show you, and actually, um, I'm not following my own advice. I'm just, I'm going to share that with you because, you know, no one's perfect, but um, it, it's easy to show you something that you shouldn't be doing when I actually have a visual. So um, I've probably just rambled on. So I am, I consider myself quiet for the most part, but if you want to get me talking and potentially regretting it, um, ask me about my children, ask me about, you know, all things that go with homesteading, so the gardening, the preserving, or ask me about winemaking. Those things I can just, I can talk about, I can ramble about, um, because I, I really enjoy them. They make me happy. Um, I, I started winemaking essentially just to see if I could make wine as good as the ones that I would buy from the store. Um, you know, there are a lot of really good local wineries in my area that make great wine. So I make wine, but I also keep wine in my house from my, fav my favorite local wineries um, for when I have a taste for it, right? Because... My goal wasn't to um, imitate their wine. My goal was to make my own wine that tasted just as good. But of course, you know, there are flavors that I really like and um, those are the ones that I make. So the wines that I make the most of are Concord, Niagara, Fredonia, and Catawba. Um, but I've also made... So right now I have a peach bulk aging. I have a cherry bulk aging. I've made a pineapple, which was a huge hit. And I actually only have one bottle left in my house. So um, that will be up next on um, and you know, that would just be one of the wines that I make next. I've made a mango. I do blends of the wines that I have. I've done um, Moscato, a Riesling, a Viognier. Oh, what else? Um, orange pineapple, orange mango, an apple, blueberry, blueberry lemonade. Um, I think I have a diamond down there. I think that's the majority of them. I'm probably forgetting maybe one or two um, but I use the same process for all of them you have wine bulk aging in the basement so I can take you through um, the process of sweetening that wine so I'll, I will do a video of that um, and again what you sweeten your wine to um, what bricks level you sweeten your wine to after it's done fermenting again is a personal preference I am a sweet wine drinker, so um, the majority of my wine is um, sweetened after it's done fermenting and after it's done bulk aging. I do make a dry Niagara, my Viognier is a dry wine, and my Riesling is a semi-dry, so I don't sweeten my Riesling as much as I do some of my other wines. Um, so, you know, you will... You know, you will alter my process to what suits you best. 
you should do a lot of reading. Um, the winemaking community is extremely friendly, just like the homesteading community. Um, so if you have questions, you can just ask. You know, when I was going through my winemaking process and, you know, something didn't seem right, something didn't feel right, I would go into the Facebook group and, you know, I would ask a question and multiple people would comment and give me suggestions and advice. And then you can research the suggestions and advice that they give you because, right, everyone does, you know, you'll have 10 people that find 10 different ways to do the same thing. So, you know, you take their advice, you do your research and you pick um, the solution that works best for you. Because, you know, the way I make wine is not the only way to make wine, um, but it's the way that works best for me. Um... I'm just trying to think if I forgot anything else important. So if you want to make wine along with me, if you want to have your supplies ready to go, um, you know, you're going to need yeast. And again, all of these things you can find on Amazon. So you're going to need yeast. If you do a small batch, you don't need such a big spoon. Um, you don't need such a big siphon. And Oh, you know, my small siphon is in here. So it just has a, oh no, that's stuck. It just has a, a bottle brush in it, but this is the small siphon. So one gallon jug, five gallon carboy. So I have both because I have both sizes of um, jugs. Um, so like if you want to be able to buy things as you go, I would say the first thing for you to buy would be your hydrometer kit, your yeast, um, yeast nutrient, yeast energizer, and your Cambid tablets. And most importantly, sanitizer. So, because if you start with a small batch, you could probably just use one of the spoons that you cook with. Again, just wash it with soap and water and then sanitize it. I keep everything separate because I make a lot of wine, so it just makes sense for me to keep those things um, separate. But when I made my first small batch, I did just use a, a spoon from my kitchen to, to stir my wine. Um, so yeah, so I would get those things first because you won't need everything else right away. So I would start with those and then, um, you know, honestly, you could use anything as a fermentation vessel. Just make sure that there's a good amount of headspace because um, the wine is going to, um, it's gonna bubble up, it's gonna be fermenting. And if you get a nice aggressive ferment, um, you have to be mindful so that way your your juice doesn't overflow because then you'll have a mess on your hands. So since it takes about seven to 10 days for things to ferment, then you could, you know, if you needed to wait a few days, you could do that and then you can get your bung and your airlocks. Again, these are on Amazon. I think you could get a pack of three. And I'm actually not gonna say how much I think it costs because I haven't needed to buy these in a very long time. And I don't know if the prices have increased, but all of this stuff you can find on Amazon for, for fairly cheap. Um, even some have actual kits. And then you can also find um, things like carboys and um, the five gallon buckets. You can find those secondhand on Facebook Market, Craigslist. Um, I know that Lowe's and Walmart, they both have the five gallon buckets that are food grade. So just make sure that any plastic you use is food grade. I believe if it's food grade, it has the number two on it. And I do know that the ones at Walmart are food grade and the ones, some of the ones at Lowe's are food grade. Just look for that number two on the bucket. And I think, I think that's it. Um, it's probably a lot of information, um, probably wasn't provided in the most organized format, but 
you know, pull out the pieces of information that are helpful for you. And all of this will make a lot more sense once we get into the actual wine making process. Just show you quickly the wine that I have in my, in my basement right now. I'm down in my basement. This is where I keep all of my bulk aging wine. Um, at my last house, I honestly just kept these in my dining room. Um, you can see I have six gallon carboys, five gallon carboys, one gallon carboys, and um, a half gallon carboy or jugs, whatever you wanna call them. But you can see right here, this wine has a lot of sediment at the bottom, which means it's time to rack it. I also have some more wine over here. Um, these boxes actually just have bottles of wine in them. And actually you have a few that have um, some weird looking stuff around the neck of the cardboard that I'm not exactly sure what it is, but I'm gonna do some research to figure it out. I mean, it's likely a headspace issue. So you can see a lot of my wines are not at the right headspace. So headspace is just the amount of space between um, the liquid and the top of the vessel. So this one, for example, this one is extremely low because you really want to keep your liquid levels to about right here or even right here would be fine. So this, once I rack it, I'll need to put it into a smaller carboy, which is why I said you should have a bunch of different size carboys. And excuse the dust, um, these have gone through a move and I just haven't had time. They're actually a little bit neglected if I'm being honest. Um, so I'm gonna get down here and um, get these wines back to where they need to be. So this cool little cart, it has wheels on it. I bought this from someone who was no longer going to be making wine. I bought this little cart from them and I also bought a bunch of carboys from them. So when these carboys are full, especially the five and six gallon ones, the three gallon is not so bad. Um, they are extremely heavy. Um, and if you're washing them, you know, they can get slippery. So please, please, please be careful when you're handling these carboys. If you need to, and you have some scrap wood laying around, the wheels aren't terribly expensive. You know, you could make something similar or you could even use um, those furniture moving dollies and put something on there to make it easier to carry, but just be safe. Some people use plastic, um, but since I bulk age, I don't want to do that in plastic so I continue to use glass and then you also could potentially make something like this again this came with the carboy this is something that the person had made to make carrying their carboys easier and these larger carboys actually fit really well into old milk crates too so again these larger carboys um will probably make, again, since their, their headspace is not where it should be, they will probably make about 25 bottles of wine. But I will show you the process of racking these and, um, and you know, adding the, the Camden tablets and the sweetening process. So that way you'll be able to, you know, make wine in your home. And again, you know, you should check your local laws. Um, you know, I'm aware of how much wine that I can make in my house without getting myself in trouble. Um, so nothing, you know, this is a lot of wine, but again, you know, I could make up to 200 gallons in my house per year and no one's going to come looking for me. So you check um, what the laws are in your area, um, you know, before you start this process just to make sure that you're not um, violating any laws. So, you know, make wine at your own risk. 
you will have to determine the best alcohol levels for yourself. And you know, you will eventually need bottles. And actually I need to order. So because there's at least 70 gallons of wine down here, I will need about 350 bottles, probably somewhere closer to 400 because I know um, I didn't count. I don't think I counted the, the one gallon carboys in the number of gallons that I have down here. So if I did that, that would be another 20 or so bottles of wine. So I probably would just order about 400 bottles um, or maybe a little bit less because I do have some bottles in here. Unfortunately, since I give away the majority, not all of the bottles come back to me, uh, which means that I have to buy new bottles. I have friends that are close. They usually bring the bottles back, um, but our family is far away. So I don't get those bottles back. And a lot of the times I give this wine away by the case. So keep an eye out for part two. We are going to get right into making those kit wines. I've rambled on <laughs> for a long time, but I do hope that you find some helpful information in this video. Um, you know, I appreciate everyone who has liked, who has commented, who has subscribed. You know, being an, an introvert and being someone who is um, normally on the quieter side, you know, I wasn't really sure how people would um, accept my personality, you know, my nervous tics that, you know, I can see in the videos, but you guys have been so very kind to me. And I really appreciate that as you kind of go with me through this process, you know, I've gotten so many suggestions on how to do things better. Um, you know, I know that I've had a volume issue. I am working on that. Um, please just be mindful that I am literally learning as I go. Um, and I'm just, you know, I can only go up from here, right? So my videos hopefully can only get better. So, you know, I appreciate your kindness. I appreciate your patience. I appreciate you, you hanging out with me. You know, I hope you stick around. If you're new here, you know, I hope you find this video helpful. Um, you know, whether you're new here, if you've been here before, honestly, I just hope that you you continue to stick around and, and hang out with me and my family. I'm going to stop this video here because it's getting extremely long. I'm doing my best to keep my videos on the shorter side. Um, but, you know, if you have any questions about anything that I've said in this video, you know, if there's something that you feel I didn't explain, very well just let me know and I will um, explain it in the comments I can put it in the description box um, just to make things easier for you so you know what to buy if you need some links I can um, you know put some links in the description or in the comments please just just let me know what information that you would need to make wine making easier for you so as always Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video.